This is not an autopsy and we don't claim that this is the truth. This is merely a series of our stories, a collection of what's real to us and of what really happened through our eyes. Follow me to 1981. Enter the premises on the premise of peace. Doors open, welcome to all. Culture elevated over a backdrop of collage lives. Bite into an ethnic mashup. Chippy chip served with jerk chicken and curried goat wrapped in a naan bread. Black grape, Appletons, Alvinos. The sweet smells of home. Welcome to the moss. Moss side had so many positive aspects. The people, I think, were our biggest assets. When I was younger, I felt it was an exciting place to live, and I think that as a teenager, it was even more exciting because everything happened in Moss side. We had a seriously close-knit community. You know, uh, if you touch one person in this community, touch a lot of people in this community. You could leave your house, you could leave your doors open, nobody will rob your house because, you know, the neighbours would be looking out for it. To me, Mossside was refreshingly friendly and I felt that the local police officers were able to tell me of the rapport that they had. Before 81, you know, you had black and white people living in this community quite close. We just used to play out all the time, there's lots of kids about. We used to play kick the can all the time and, and old, old games that you don't really hear of anymore. You made your games outside. You played Kingsley, you played Curbsley, you played... These are the things, you had a go-kart. These are the things, you had your bike. At that time, we didn't have the gangs as you have now. What we had was young people involved in sound systems. You know, and they would compete against each other. It was a beautiful place to live. The ominous cauldron stew slowly simmers, armed with a volatile undercurrent ready to bubble over. That fateful week, the ripe July sun beating down onto cracked pavements. Economy down, unemployment high, in a fierce climate of discrimination. Laws enforced to suss out the cause. In a place that's culturally rich, yet financially poor. Tension ascends, piercing through the atmosphere. Up from the pavement and into the air. Doomsday looming. But not that it's a secret. But nobody wants to instigate. That's why nobody speaks it. The young people found that they had the twin problems of bad housing and little chance of, an, of employment and so that allied with their relationships with the, with the local police force was seemed to be a recipe for impending disaster. There was an undercurrent of unhappiness that young black males were feeling because there was high unemployment. People were leaving the secondary schools and not being taken on as apprentices, were not being employed. Um, they were being told that they were um, living off um, the social security and that they weren't going to amount to anything. You should be working, but you can't be working. We don't want to employ you, but we don't want to subsidise you. Um, we, want, we don't want you in, in any of our buildings, but we don't want you out on the streets. The main thing is that they were saying is that there's too many of the black kids on the street, you know. What are you supposed to do? You know, you come from school, four o'clock, what are you supposed to do? There's no computers, computers weren't invented then. There was no internet, you know. You made games and you played games outside, so you had to play football, cricket, whatever. The, the schools themselves had preconceptions about young people, particularly young black boys, uh, in terms of the career choices that they had. They were being encouraged to be sportsmen and women rather than to follow an academic route. There was all of that that was going on. 80% of the young people, on the, the young black community, 
under 25 were unemployed at that time. So you've got that cocktail going on and it's bound to be building up and waiting to erupt. At that time there was a, a, a huge kind of separation between police and people. The, the idea of community and the idea of police helping you out wasn't on the cards at all. There was a lot of general feeling in the community that they had bad policing. I can remember an elderly white woman who lived not far from me when I moved in next to her saying, oh, we have bad police here. They come to Moss Side because they think with all the clubs and everything that uh, there are good pickings. So there was a, a sort of, not just young people, but generally there was a feeling that we have bad policing, they pick on young people, particularly young black men. The police felt that they had carte blanche to stop, arrest and cart off people whenever they felt like. They tended to ignore any kind of protest from anybody trying to intervene. I think where the problem started was when the users get picked up for sauce. They haven't done anything, yeah, on suspicion of doing what? They were picked up, held in prison, uh, in, in Platt Lane, yeah, and they used to be like physical abuse and mental abuse, calling you black bastard, you this, you that. You know, and I think the users got fed up of it, to be quite honest with you. There was this stop and search that was happening to people on such a regular basis, that building up, why are they doing this to me? What have I done wrong? All I'm doing is going out to mix around with my mates and I'm being stopped and searched, or driving a car down the road, and the presumption is that if you're driving a car as a black person, you can't afford this, and therefore we're going to stop and search you. There's no question about that. It was the sus law that caused it, in terms of, you know, you, you'll find that there are black officers who will tell you that they themselves had used the sus law, because it was the thing to do. We weren't using it as a tool of, as, of oppression, um, per se. We were using it as, as a police power, a necessary police power, to stop and detect crime. But the perception was that it was actually used more widely against members of the black community. But it was a power that was used against black, or, you know, people regardless of race, colour, creed or background. It was a fairly, fairly easy law to, to inflict because you only had to show suspicion in your mind about somebody going to break into a car or whatever it was. And it was also, of course, an, an unpopular law for people who were being stopped because they didn't like it. And so, in a sense, I think, generally speaking, the police service, and Robin Oak in particular, thought, I'd rather we didn't have this law. So I, I would discourage its use. The superintendent of Moss Side Police Station, I believe it was Robin Oak, was probably a well-intentioned, strong Christian who I actually believe wanted the best. The problem was that he had no idea what his foot soldiers were doing on the streets. On Moss Side, they had a boss who actually knew what was going on. And I used to go on parade with these lads when the sergeants were putting them out on duty and say, look, this is the latest rumor I've heard. Something about what you've been talking about, nigger bashing and so on. I will not stand for it. We knew that the police routinely battered young black people. The special patrol group was not notorious. And frankly, I don't care what Robin Oak says about that. He makes the police, all of them, you know, seem as if they were all smelling of roses. That was not the experience of young people in the community. I would completely refute that the riots were actually started. And you know, I don't like that word riot because of anti-police feeling. To try and analyze what, what caused the riots, uh, it's quite wrong to say the police caused it. It's, it's almost as if that is the focal point, that's the bullseye, that's what started the riots. There's no evidence of that whatever. Mix up oppression with a bit of aggression. Cinnamon, adrenaline, hostility beckons. Effervescent dejection. Depressing impressions. The unemployed all rise with dispirited weapons. Wielding spirited bottles full of flammable pressure. Testosterone, stamina, fearless aggressors. This is the zone of the war. This is the uprise. Molotov saw as the sticks and foots fly. Cold and shatters. Turbulent gush glides into the scorching cooker where the mixture erupts high. Then sprinkle clashes, screams on the quiet. And our very own recipe for a riot. It was like electricity. You, you, you could sense something was going to happen. 
There was a genuine sense of anger building up and building up, waiting to erupt here in Moss Side, and it was just a matter of when it would happen. There had been um, rumblings of impending trouble. There had been calls to the paper, um, and I think we had sent a reporter out that night, in that sort of warm night in July, uh, to be on standby because there was talk and there were anonymous calls saying it's all going to kick off tonight. when a young men came out of a club on Princess Road and just went loopy up Princess Road and then it was galvanised and other people joined it and, um, and, and it just took off from there. There was a sound, a noise, and when we interpreted it, it said, Moss Side is on fire. My father was ringing up at home saying, oh, you can't know what's going on on Princess Road because the, the kids were just running up and down the street. The noise was so intense, you know, um, that those of us who were in bed decided to get up and go and see what was happening. We saw Princess Road very much ablaze with um, fire engines and so on on Princess Road and police kind of opposite the crowd, and the crowd were out on the grass by Quinny Crescent having a look, really. There were probably 100, 150, maybe 200 young people, black and white, who were massed on, on, on the Crescent. There were calls to the news desk, I remember, suggesting that there were um, outside influences being brought to bear. Um, and that's probably because there had been trouble already in Toxteth and elsewhere. Um, and so uh, the following day after the riots, the, I think the police themselves talked about outsiders being, uh, if you like, to blame uh, for stirring it up. I saw youngsters there who were from Withenshaw. There was also a report that there were youngsters from Liverpool who came along. I think, you know, it was, it was a day out for a lot of young people. Let's go and, you know, we've done Brixton, we've done, you know, um, St Paul's, let's try Liverpool and Manchester. I can say that I was out and about for most of the nights that the rioting took place, and I can categorically say there were no outside instigators who set this off. It's difficult to know on the first night quite what sparked the kind of immediate trouble. But then the aftermath of that, when some people got arrested and people couldn't find out what happened to them, uh, there was a kind of growing sense then that, well, this might well grow into something even bigger. And, and, it, and it did. During the day, that's when we heard the rumour that the police station was going to be attacked in the evening. It was not just one rumour, several of my bobbies were out on the street and listening to conversations. And in fact, I had one or two telephone calls from people I know in Moss Side to say that we have heard that they're going to attack the police station tonight. The night of the attack on the police station, we were stood outside at a fence, watching on. A bit scared, a bit eerie, a bit... It was a bit smoky, actually. Like a foggy night. You know, like bonfire night. That's the, you know, that sort of feeling you get. I remember that. A mob. I say a mob. This, again, was probably 200 or more young people. Again, black and white, mainly male, who decided to march on Moss Side Police Station, Green A's Police Station. They marched to the police station and I think that it's quite lucky for Mossad Police Station that the fact that some young people tried to get into uh, an earth mover, a JCB, and the problem was that they could not actually get the JCB started because the plan was to drive the JCB through the front doors of Mossad Police Station. 
It started off by just walking along near the brewery and then the all set. Most like police station, let's charge. And that's what they did. And they got to the police station, they absolutely surrounded the old place and just started to hurl anything that they had in sight. Bottles, bricks, sticks, the lot. The old thing was so frightening. When I went along to Green Ace police station and I saw police officers cowering on top of the police station because there were youngsters trying to get to them, I can only speculate what would have happened if they had got in that police station. I think that people would have died that night. It's as, it was as serious as that. It seemed a mighty long while that we had windows being broken, bricks being thrown through, one or two trying to climb into the police station who the ten of us were doing what we could to keep them out. And in, in, the cars and the vans in the police station yard were attacked and damaged. It was quite frightening, I have to say that. In, in a policing term, when an officer requires assistance, it means they're in trouble and they need help quick. And you would normally expect an individual or two officers or three officers to find themselves in a position where they needed assistance. But to hear that a police station needed assistance was just mind on me. And there were Molotov cocktails being thrown at it, there were bottles, there were bricks. But when they found that they couldn't penetrate the police station or indeed break it down, they decided to go back towards Princess Road and finish off what they were doing there. All I knew is that within moments, the crowd, the shouting, the whistling, the booing, and all the hollering that was going on suddenly just died down. Oh, that night, all the shops were on Princess Road have been looted. looted I've, seen people, and... I've seen people running across the grass verge with televisions. On the heads and and televisions on the Two men, head. one either end of a settee, running with it on the heads, and they totally emptied the furniture shop, the tobacconists, the men's clothes outfitters, the jewellers on the court. Everything just got totally emptied that night. At least for their part, were going around with, with their shields, batten, and, and, and making monkey noise. And when they saw a group of youngsters, they would rattle their shields and they were saying, come on. The police in the area were obviously spoiling for a fight. They expected trouble and their behaviour tended to sort of provoke a reaction from the young people. Where police officers were on, uh, were on foot, in numbers, they were banging on their shields. Uh, where they were in vans, uh, they would be banging on, on the side of the vans um, and um, to intimidate people. Um, horns, sirens going, etc. It is, it is intimidating. People running and screaming, people being bitten up. The police in the vans, um, they were driving up and down Maslin East and hitting their clubs at the side of the van, shouting, nigger, 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 oi, oi, oi. I've heard the rumours that you've mentioned. I still refute the fact that, certainly in Moss Side, police, policemen were not doing it. I would, I can't deny or actually affirm what happened with other policemen being drafted in. The feeling was that this was an alien occupying army, the way that they were travelling along the roads. And they toured the area like this. And more police came, you know what I mean? So they started to, they had the, the arm gear, you know, they had the, the riot gear on, you know? So then they looked like they're gonna charge, you know? A couple of people pick up things and threw, and we threw, you know, and we all joined in and threw back at the police. Lester had gone outside to have a look what was going on. And the dogs was barking. And when he went out, there was police at one end, which was on the grass verge that surrounded the estate, and there was several youths, well, a couple of hundred youths, at the opposite end of our street, and they'd built a fire across the street. And they was at one side, and the police was up at the top, and they were just shouting abuse and throwing things over, and the police was coming forward with the shields. 
At that particular moment, I remembered seeing that the police charged the, the crowd of rioters and they withdrew. Um, well, then the rioters would charge back again. So when the police retreated, there was one, this one police that was behind. He tripped and fell right in front of me, to be quite honest with you. There were shouts of, let's kill him. You know, there was anger at night. Something just snapped him and I jumped in front of them and said, no, you can't do that. You know, I won't let you. I won't let you kill a man for doing his job. Uh, plus, uh, what's going to happen to you when you're locked up for murder? What's going to happen to your families? What's going to happen to your children? If you have any sense in your head, you'll break it up and all go home. To my surprise, they all broke up and went home. In all the stuff that was going on, Hot Hanley was one of the spokespeople at the time, coming from a, a youth club, the Hideaway in Moss Side. It was a very respected youth club by the young black uh, lads in particular, and black girls. And he was very definitely somebody that had his finger on the pulse. And there he was, ushering them into the youth centre to stop them from being beaten up. And he was beaten up himself. Five or six coppers were actually kicking the crap out of me. And like an idiot, now that I think about it, I said, is that the effing best?